Hello, I'm so excited for you to meet today's guest. Her name is Sue Van Rays, and she has been in private practice helping women heal their relationship with food and find peace with their plates for decades. So after a lifelong battle, well, a battle that began as a battle that turned into a healing journey, Sue really has found a surprising path to unlocking freedom around your food. She is non-dogmatic. She is feminine healing oriented. And today we talk about your nervous system and food, how our control behavior shows up, disordered eating and what it has to do with disordered money behavior, all the different ways that the different parts of us are running the show, how to balance your blood sugar, how our stress levels interact with our blood sugar, and so much more. So if you have had any kind of battle or anxiety or control behavior around food, this is the episode for you. Sue's work has been featured by People Magazine, The Chopra Center, Elephant Journal, and more. She has an integrative nutrition background, a functional nutrition background. She is absolutely just this beautiful, nurturing, healing energy, and you are going to absolutely find this episode so healing and nurturing for you. So enjoy. Welcome to Plenty. I'm your host, Kate Northrup, and together we are going on a journey to help you have an incredible relationship with money, time, and energy, and to have abundance on every possible level. Every week, we're going to dive in with experts and insights to help you unlock a life of plenty. Let's go fill our cups. Please note that the opinions and perspectives of guests on the Plenty podcast are not necessarily reflective of the opinions and perspectives of Kate Northrup or anyone who works within the Kate Northrup brand. Hey, Sue, thank you for being here. Kate, it is so great to be here with you and to come to Miami and see you in person. Thank you for having me. Oh my God. It's an absolute pleasure. I, as I told you, I really loved your book. There are so many new concepts in it that I had not heard about or not heard about in this particular way. And I have read so many books <laughs> on food and nutrition over the last 30 years or so. Um, so, you, you know, it's, it's really beautifully done. So I want to start with blood sugar. I think that one of the things that we really misunderstand is the importance of blood sugar, especially uh, if people are more plant-based, uh, especially because folks eat a lot of processed foods. And something I hear from folks who think they're really healthy eaters when they tell me about what they're eating, and not that I work in nutrition as a field, but I know more than average people. Um, I can tell that their relationship with their blood sugar is all out of whack. So first of all, how, what are some of the signs that somebody mm. is, has, has some blood sugar issues that it might be an area to tune into for them? Absolutely. I mean, I really see it as so foundational in how we feel and how food can help us feel how we want to feel or can kind of accidentally take us down a different path. And there's so many different kinds of symptoms that come with blood sugar imbalance, but the ones that are going to happen in real time, like when you've maybe had a meal prior or that day where your blood sugar's off, are generally going to be things like feeling a big drop in your energy, um, noticing you're craving sugar a lot, which I think often that can be confusing because we just might be like, oh, I'm having a sugar craving and I have a sweet tooth and that might be even part of our story or ID identity. Um, there's definitely going to be times where we notice that we're like shaky. Um, one of mine is definitely hangry or grumpy mm -hmm. where we just notice all of a sudden we're like super irritable or sensitive or, you know, even our mood can plummet. And as I talk about in the book, also there's so much going on with like our brain chemistry. And so it's so fascinating to me to see how our brain chemistry is mimicking our blood sugar and mm -hmm that can set us up for a complete downfall throughout the day if we're not kind of starting off on the right foot. It's like a, 
you know, the roller coaster starts with breakfast sometimes. And that's when a lot of people are eating kind of more high carb, high sugary, quick on the go breakfasts. And then the rest of the day can just obviously take a downturn. I think we can self-correct if that happens, you know, with different things throughout the day, but it is a hundred percent going to affect how we feel. And, um, there's just endless things that are happening inside of us biochemically that are um, in unison with that blood sugar drop, including our hormones, including you know noticing the different ways that our bodies are either burning fat or burning glucose, and it just you know kind of goes on and on. And then what's also interesting is there's lo- obviously long-term things that are going to take a little bit more time to show up. Like what? So inflammation, for example, I mean, I've had clients who get their blood sugar back into balance and they notice their arthritis symptoms improve, or they notice their back pain improve, or things that are going on chronically. Um, Another one is actually just the gut microbiome and the balance of good flora and bad bacteria that feed off of sugar. And so sometimes our digestion is going to be the problem. I feel like we all sort of have like different weak links in our systems. Yeah. And that'll it, be our barometer that something's yeah, off. Yeah. And it's so yeah. some people might notice one thing where someone else might notice another, but generally we're going to find that if we're not in balance with our blood sugar, we're, we're generally just not going to feel that great. We're not going to feel in balance. And do you recommend way. people actually test their blood sugar, like with a continuous glucose monitor or with a finger prick? Like, should we get that scientific about things if we, if this is an area we're working on? You know, I love tracking so and getting I. some information. <laughs> and so am I. And so I think that if it's something that's problematic or you're curious or you've noticed that this is like genetic and you have some kind of sensitivity in your family that's, you know, traceable and that you're really interested in learning what works. I did 30 days on a CGM a couple of years ago. And even after studying blood sugar for almost two decades at that point, I still learned a lot. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. So I did a continuous glucose monitor and here's what I found. And I'm curious your thoughts on this. I found that, so I've been working on balancing my blood sugar and eating a low glycemic diet since I was in my 20s. So I've got that pretty dialed in. However, my blood sugar was spiking in the morning when I was getting my kids off to school and at night during the dinner bedtime kind Mm. of rush. So it was obviously Mm stress-induced. What do I do about that given that like I can't – it's not diet-related with me. It was stress-related. So what are some suggestions and why might that happen? Why might stress be – like why might, you know, off-to-school transition and (laughs) dinner-bedtime transition be spiking my blood sugar if those are not times when I'm eating like a bowl of Cheerios or something? Totally. So, And I'm not drinking wine. Just to be (laughs) clear, I don't drink. Right. Okay. So I think we can definitely speak to a lot of the parents out there. I remember Mm -hmm. school drop off every day that I took my kids to school felt like a victory. (laughs) Like even, you know, totally. it's just like day by day, I feel like we should all like hop onto some kind of celebratory (laughs) podcast or, you know, (laughs) broadcast and be like, we made it through another morning. Um, And so it is really stressful. And when we're stressed, we know like that our bodies go into that adrenaline or cortisol or sometimes both elevation and that releases sugar into the blood. So stress literally spikes the blood sugar. And why does it do that? Why would that happen in our body? So if you were imagining yourself being chased by a lion, which is one of my favorite analogies to use in multiple scenarios when it comes to blood sugar and the nervous system, um, we want energy. We want something. We want fuel. Yeah. And that that sugar in the blood elevating is there to give us that extra little boost that we need to run away from the mountain lion or what have you, the grizzly bear. Although, obviously, you and I both know that stress in our culture is rampant and that we shouldn't always be running away from the lion or the grizzly bear, but yet we often feel like we are. So... This is going to sound interesting for you because I know you specialize in this as, you know, something that you're so passionate about, but, you know, how can you in those mornings and in those pickups do extra nervous system regulation? How can you manage your stress? I mean, I have a friend, I think you and I both know Kimberly Ann Johnson, actually, and 
you know, she speaks so, so wisely about the nervous system and I've learned so much from her. But one thing that I remember her speaking about on something that she did um, was that she put on a playlist in the morning and that that helped her morning situation, getting her teenager out the door and getting her to school so much more than you would expect. Like it's these tiny little shifts that can help. And the reality is we don't have control of everything, of course, when it comes to our kids and of course, getting them out the door and like finding the right pair of shoes or the right, you know, t-shirt to wear that matches the, I'm like, you, yep. Again, once again, it's getting dressed every single freaking day. Yes. We are getting dressed again. <laughs> Why is it no. so hard? Every day, brushing teeth, brushing hair, socks, shoes, water bottle, snacks. I'm like... Why is this so hard? <laughs> but it's so hard. It just hard. is, but I love that. Yeah, and they're you know, tired. I think the small things that we can do yeah. that help us feel more resourced, like adding in a playlist. Yeah. I love that. And I mean, also, I, as you said, you're aware of balancing your blood sugar in the yes. morning and knowing how to do that with like good quality protein and fat, most likely, I'm assuming. I mean, you can turn up the volume on that too, you know. So tell me more like, about that. just... If we were thinking of, and I don't prescribe to any eating style and any specific thing that we all should be doing, so just to be clear, but I do believe that if we turn up the volume on the fat and protein, almost in like a slightly ketogenic fashion, whether that be plant-based or whether that be from animal protein or whatever works for your body and your metabolism, um, it helps because it's calming. It is very calming because it helps our body feel safe. It's right? calming. Like, it helps our body feel safe. It helps. Our, yeah, it's so it, good. Yeah, and it really does just completely like take that blood sugar spike that is you know possible for us at any point, whether it be because of food or because of stress, and it blunts it. Yeah. And you know, so for me, it's like the difference of, for example, a smoothie in the morning where I have protein and greens and maybe maybe a little fruit, not always. Versus one where I add a, an extra table, tablespoon of coconut oil to the smoothie. I mean, it just changes it. Like you can tell the oh, difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can tell. And I, win, I mean, it's years of being the witness in my body. Yes. But I often, when I was taking my kids to school, they're both in their 20s now. But when I was taking my kids to school, you know, that was kind of the, I would drop them off and then I would go do some kind of exercise most mornings. And I remember really tracking the difference between the extra fat in my smoothie and my morning hike. Mm -hmm. And without it, I would, you know, I would need a snack partway through the hike or I would notice my energy drop off a little bit. That extra little bit of coconut oil or MCT right. oil or something like that that I tend to use um, definitely, you know, kept me satiated longer, kept me more even longer. And my exercise, whatever that was, yeah. um, was more balanced. I could feel it. I love that. So as a child of the 80s and 90s, you know, I grew up in the low fat era with like snack wells and thinking that fat was the problem. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like we're super far beyond that, but the programming runs mm. deep. So for people who may still be thinking that a low fat diet, that they should be watching their fat intake and that they should feel all nervous about it, talk to me about the beauty of adding healthy fats to your diet totally. and why we don't need to be eating a low fat diet and why Absolutely. that might be a problem. Absolutely. For those I mean, of us honestly, who got super brainwashed. <laughs> we got so brainwashed. <laughs> and Kate, you wouldn't believe how many of my clients come into my yeah. office today. It's so misunderstood. Still completely fat phobic. Yeah. And it's such a shame because when we look back at that research now, it's actually been shown by more recent research that the research wasn't even like done well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the data wasn't even really solid data. So the whole fat-free era was kind of a big hoax and it left us all feeling like crap. In fact, I remember- Probably driven by the processed food oh, industry. Oh, for sure. When I first moved to Boulder, Colorado in the early 90s, um, you know, there was that whole health food movement was really strong and I was like really into it. And also vegetarianism was really popular at that point. So my poor little hypoglycemic body went into low fat vegetarian for, I don't know, a couple of few years. And it was 
so bad for me. I felt so imbalanced. And, and then I started to really suffer like more depletion over, over time. Um, when we have the ability and the nutrient density within high fat and high protein, and of course, good quality on both of those, um, we are able to actually get into fat burning. We are stabilizing our blood sugar. Um, we are burning more fat for fuel. It's more even. It's like slow burning. Mm. You know, whereas glucose is a little more fast burning. And there's times when that's needed yes. and that can help if we're running a marathon or on a really long bike ride or something that we need endurance. Um, but on the average day, we don't need that fast burning fuel as much as we would have thought. And this, I mean, if even just the word slow burning, it just sounds better to me, like mm -hmm. more, even more consistent, keeping our energy stable, keeping our mood stable, all of those things. Um, and we eat that to feel how we want to feel, which is most of us are wanting to feel calm and stable and slow burning rather yeah. than that up and down spike and crash roller coaster that, you know, doesn't feel good. No, it really doesn't. So adding in healthy fats is like really one of the best ways to do that. Now you talked about, and we, we spoke about it just a minute ago, uh, with the continuous glucose monitor and my blood sugar spikes, mm -hmm. the nervous system. I absolutely love the way, you know, I love the nervous system, but mm -hmm. I love the way you spoke about the nervous system in food and freedom and how you talked about the way the nervous system impacts our appetite, our satiety, our blood sugar. So can you paint us a picture of the, okay, your description of the nervous system, our folks have probably heard me talk about it a million <laughs> times, but everyone talks about it differently. So yeah. what is the nervous system and what does it have to do with the way we eat? We'll just start there. Okay. So I was actually thinking about this prior to our conversation because it's such a juicy topic and we both love this, mm -hmm. this subject. But one thing I want to say is I believe that we toggle back and forth. Imbalanced blood sugar is dysregulating. Yes. Okay. So that's number one. Like I've seen it and you know, our kids are often our greatest teachers, but we see what happens to our kids if they eat sugar, right? Yeah. They become dysregulated. Yes. And so, so number one. So many feelings. <laughs> <laughs> um, and not that there's anything wrong with feelings, but imbalanced blood sugar really like adds, it's like pouring gasoline oh, on a fire. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So there's that. And then there's the opposite, which is our nervous systems can impact our blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So when we go into a fight or flight response, let's just pretend that's you on a morning taking yeah. your kids to school and you get that adrenaline rush or you're running late, like running late can just stress me out without any other Absolutely. factors involved. Um, and so that also will, once again, release that extra glucose into the blood and give you that sort of rush that's helpful in a sense, yeah. like on a primal level, but not really helpful when it comes to like managing our lives well, being calm and centered for our kids. And I mean, luckily there's lots of ways we know that can help us regulate, but there is just so much dance between the two, kind of like the chicken and the egg, which came first. Um, but I really find that the nervous system also informs our eating in like more on like a grander scale, I would say. So for example, if you're going through a really strong period of stress and your adrenaline's way high and off the charts and you're not sleeping well, you're probably gonna not feel hungry that much. And once again, we don't really wanna be hungry if we're getting chased by the grizzly bear. That's not a great time to be like, I just need a snack. I'll, I'll get back to running in a minute. So we get flooded with adrenaline. We get flooded with stomach acid. We actually shut down digestion altogether. And so if we're going through a really long-term period of stress or acute stress, like, yeah, that's when we might literally have no appetite. And most of us can think of a time when that has happened, right? So that would be more of like the fight or flight response in extreme. Mm -hmm. But when we have sort of a more subtle fight or flight response going on based on, you know, day-to-day -day kind of stressors and 
stories in our minds about ourselves and things that we have that are kind of stressing us out as a whole, and so many of us do as our, yeah. in our culture. Um, we also will notice these other type of more subtle responses with the fight or flight response. For example, if we are feeling um, like we are, you know, choosing between how, like what we're going to order at a restaurant mm -hmm. and we're under a fight or flight response, we might feel like we are kind of having extremes with our boundaries or feeling a little bit like um, rebellious around our food or feeling a little bit confrontational around the choices we make or being judged for what we're eating. And I find that a lot, you know, that happens a lot. I've seen it with so many of my clients where um, the fight or flight response is more subtle and it brings up a lot of feelings around food, a lot of sort of um, oppositional feelings. Yes, that yeah. rebellious. I, 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 I can really track some friends and clients where I've witnessed that kind of like, I'm not going to follow the rules and like, this is my way of breaking free and I don't, you know, and, and like, yeah, eating in a way that's almost this, uh, rebellion that's not super disruptive for your life, but it needs to get out somewhere. Totally. It's so interesting that you said that. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about like fight, right. Just the word fight, like we're right. fighting something. Yeah. What are we fighting? Are we fighting the food itself? Are we fighting the person talking to us about our food? Are we fighting our mother who's asking us what we want for lunch totally. or our partner or, you know, our friend? And there's so many ways that can show up. The flight response, I think, would be a little different because that might look like more avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, fleeing is kind of, you know, checking out in a way of that situation that's right in front of us. We might not run away from the table, but if we're not physically running away from the table and fleeing, what does that feel like in our bodies to be in that flight response? And I think it can feel like, you know, we just are completely avoiding dealing with what's in front of us, of avoiding the situation. I've had, you know, clients get that get into the freeze response, which is obviously a different part of the nervous system, but freezing around food, I mean, Obviously, that can be so common because we just like shut down around making a decision or we go to the grocery store and we want to create, you know, a healthy dinner and we get in there and we get so overwhelmed totally. by all the choices. That's and we're just I like, don't go to the grocery eh. store. And then we just, I mean, yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> we can find ourselves like leaving. It's too much. It's too overstimulating for so many people. When or I'm I get like binge grocery shop behavior where I, I suddenly I went in for like eggs and then I spent $400. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's like, for me, if I go to the grocery store, like a little overly hungry, yeah. forget about or it. Or <laughs> tired. I also have this behavior. I'm curious what you would say. Now I'm just going to do a session with you. <laughs> <laughs> I have this thing. I, I've tempered it a little bit or I've moderated it a little bit, but oftentimes when we are about to travel, I do a very big unconscious grocery shop and I'll like stop our fridge and I watch myself do it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why would I just <laughs> do that? What do you think's going on? I know. With I that? was just trying to like take that in. And the first thing that comes to mind actually, and knowing you a little bit and your sort of, you know, ways around yeah. food and I feel like it's safety. Yeah. I feel like it's like, this makes you feel safe. Right having an abundance of options, having an abundance in your house that feels, well, it's like plenty. It's yeah. plenty. Having right. plenty is safety. Plenty is safety. And when plenty I travel, safety. I'm in a transition, which makes me feel right. unsafe. So right. I'm loading my refrigerator as illogical as that is to feel safe. It's fine if we're going on a two day trip, but it's a problem if it's like, yeah, well, I think for like a week, so we traveling, have all this food that goes bad. <laughs> traveling is so dysregulating. It is dysregulating. Especially pre-traveling. Actually, I do better when I'm in the airport and I'm on my way. But the, the, the prepping and the thinking of all the things we need and the thinking of what we're going to be doing and where we're going and if we don't know where we're going yeah. and there's uncertainty in the new place or the place we're staying or, you know, the adventure we're going on, then like all these feelings come up. And we're all of a sudden noticing dysregulation. Yeah. And for everyone has a different way of regulating 
kind of automatically, but if you're a foodie yeah, and that's something that makes you feel safe, that totally. would make the most sense to me. So when you're talking about travel and dysregulation, I start thinking about food and control. It feels related. One of the things that I've seen in myself is when I feel unsafe, I mean, yes, maybe I stock my fridge. I agree with you on that one. But also I have a history of getting controlling around food. And I know that um, something we know about some people with eating disorders is that it's actually uh, about control. Mm -hmm. And so talk to me about food and control and the nervous system. And what part of our nervous system is that sense of trying to control things, trying to regulate, does it work? Does it not work? And what might be other strategies? Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me when you say that is it's a subtle but fight response Mm. because we're trying to fight for some kind of control and some kind of certainty within the uncertainty. And that can be subtle, like what you're describing, or of course it can be so, so extreme. Like when women that I work with or women in general, and I primarily work with women, so that's why I'm saying saying it that way, but there is this um, desire to control what we can. And when everything else in our life is falling apart, that can very well be the thing that we hold on to our bodies, what we put in our bodies, where we do have some agency is food. And yet at the same time, it can feel completely out of control because we have to eat food to survive. And so eventually we do. And it is also, you know, um, so there's both, like it's something we can control and it's also something in a way that we can't control. But so I think there's a spectrum there, but I would absolutely say for you, that when you're noticing that kind of gripping down on food and having what you need, especially around travel, yeah. because I mean, when we're going into the unknown, I mean, I just did it coming here for a few right. days. You know, it's like, I'm going to have this in my backpack. I'm going to make sure I go to the grocery store. When I get there, I want to make sure yeah. I have a few things in my room to feel comfortable so that I don't need to change too much too fast. Totally. Because I don't want to change too much too because, fast and not know how I'm going to feel. And there is that spectrum, which is from like self-nurturing behavior, which is really beautiful, like touching mm-hmm. down in a new city, going to the grocery store, mm-hmm. getting your snacks. Like that's a very mothering, self-mothering behavior all the way to the extreme right. of control. And, you know, you and I have been around a lot of different women and we've been a lot of different women in our lives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I can see the spectrum of sometimes it's actually like a really beautiful, healthy behavior. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it's gone really far on the end of of just being too controlling and inflexible. Yeah. 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 And learning to recognize where it tips, right? Where it tips into that extreme side of the spectrum and what are those, um, triggers really yeah. that, that do that. And it, it can be, you know, just something like going on a trip or it can be moving to a new city or it can be your parents going through a divorce or it can be moving into a college dorm and having a roommate you've never met or, you know, it can be so anything. many things, anything. Do you think, this is just occurring to me, do you think it's possible that food insensitivities could be linked to the nervous system and could be healed in some way through nervous system work? Do you mean like allergies or do you mean like just the sensitivities of going back and forth with that kind of spectrum of control? Like let's say somebody doesn't have celiac, but like is in, it has Mm -hmm. a a gluten sensitivity or a dairy sensitivity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible that that might be connected to nervous system dysregulation? Oh, 100%. Especially if we've amplified the story in our mind. So if we didn't ever hear of celiac and we were just noticing we had a stomach ache, that would be more like of a less likely scenario where that would be true, right? Because exactly. we're not really exacerbating it. We're just kind of, you know, noticing a symptom and yeah. noticing a symptom. And maybe at some point we link the symptom with the food, maybe. But when we're thinking about it and we're out there in the world, like reading the the news or the blogs or watching Instagram or doing whatever we do to get our information about food. And then we have now decided, oh, like gluten is bad. So every time we eat gluten, we're bad. Why am I doing this? I read it that it's bad. 
And then, yes, the nervous system can absolutely respond to that, depending on the extreme of the situation, and completely shut down digestion. And then, of course, you're going to have a stomachache. But is it because of the gluten, or is it because of the story in your mind, hence the nervous system reaction? Definitely possible. And I think just it can bring up a lot of fear. Food can bring up so much fear. And then we can feed the fear fear by overly researching on the internet and seeing that there's like everything across the spectrum saying, eat dairy, don't eat dairy, eat gluten, don't eat gluten, eat meat, don't eat meat. You know, like you're bad if you eat meat, but you're bad if you don't get enough protein. It's just, it's constant. It is constant. And we have to like deepen our relationship with our own body Mm -hmm. and with our own way. Because if we are constantly looking to experts, we will be forever confused. Forever. Which is one of the things I love about your philosophy. You're not like, okay, here's the exact number of grams of protein. Here's how much fat. Here's da da da. You're right. It's like a beautiful philosophy of health and deepening your relationship with self, which is of course going to lead you to freedom with food. Absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. It was so good. <laughs> so one of the things that we spoke about before that I had it had come to my attention about a year ago, this connection between disordered behavior around food and disordered behavior around money. Mm. And many of the clients that I work with who have had a history of disordered money behavior also have had a history of disordered eating. Yeah, You're the only book so far that I've read where that is discussed. So what is the connection you see between disordered behavior with money and disordered behavior with food in your practice? Absolutely. So the first thing I want to say about that is that how we do everything is how we do anything or how we do anything is how we do everything. Um, I believe Janine Roth actually was someone who said that back in one of her books. I believe it was how we do anything is how we do everything. How we eat is how we live. She did say that. Women, food, and God. Yes, I believe so. That's the one. She's such an inspiration. Oh, yes. And what I've noticed is that there is a pattern. Well, we all have patterns, right? And we're mm-hmm. just going to th- sort of overlay our patterns on so many different parts of our lives. And food and money are so big mm-hmm. as far as the places that we experience or that we think we experience power. Mm. And it's so, um, it's sad because obviously we've been trained by our society and by social constructs and by the patriarchy, by the whole, you know, that as women, you know, we have agency over a few things in our life, but a lot of them have sort of been, we've been told that, that they're not true. We've been told that we have to look outside of ourselves for power. We've been told we have to look a certain way for power. We've been told we have to have a certain, uh, bank account size or a certain amount of income for power. And while there's truth to it to a point, like, of course, there's things we can do with money that we can't do without money. And of course, there's, you know, abundance with food that can feel so comforting. And when we don't have that, that is 100% like horrific. It can feel like the scariest survival place we can go to. Um, But what I'm experiencing with people that are basically have their primary needs met, mm-hmm. right? Like they have food, they have enough money to live, even if it's simple living. Yes. Is that we're still caught in the same experience almost as if that weren't true. And so, for example, when we have the trending body size, we feel powerful, most of us. And that is manipulated by food or at least it can be, exercise as well. Um, We feel similar with money when we have, you know, that safety net, we feel more calm and centered. And when we don't, it can bring up a lot of different kinds of stress. And so our response to the stress is metabolically and nervous system wise, like kind of our go-to automatic response. So for example, if we restrict with food, and we feel like that's how we control, we're probably doing that in other areas of our life. So maybe we're restricting with money. 
Maybe we feel guilty for spending money on ourselves. Maybe we feel guilty that, you know, our budget needs a certain amount of money to be workable. Or we feel guilty for having pleasure that we buy ourselves with the money that we have in our bank account. Um, like sort of like calorie to dollar kind of yeah. thing. And of course, you know, the calorie counting method of eating, which I'm 100% not behind, there's science to it, but to be restricting that way. And I mean, then we would never eat fat, right? Because <laughs> it's like... Yeah, very calorie dense. <laughs> very calorie dense. Um, so within that model, you know, it's it's a really tricky way to manipulate our calories and our eating because we're looking, once again, from the external. Mm -hmm. And, you know, same with same with money. Like money, as you and I both know, has energy, and it can, a little bit of money can go a long way. Yeah. And a lot of money can just flow right out the window. It really can. <laughs> and so in a sense, the number isn't even real. It's not. It's all pretend. And then when we work on the level of the quantum, like if you've done any studying Absolutely. with, you know, Joe Dispenza or, you know, many people who work in that world, then we also realize that our energetic interaction with food is actually the same. Like one person could be eating one way and one person could be eating that exact same way and it could have a completely different totally. physiological impact on them because of their energetic set point or their energetic, um, how would I say it? Like, you know, the, their, just their energy around yeah. that meal and their beliefs around that meal and their mm -hmm. nervous system mm -hmm. and their whole, their whole makeup. It's interesting as you say this about restrictive behavior, because, uh, when I feel unsafe, I can to have a tendency to either get bingy with food mm -hmm. or restrictive. I can do both mm -hmm. with money. I'm more of a, um, I, I don't have like binge behavior with money, but I'm like far more expansive. I'm like, well, there's more where that came from. Right. So it's interesting just to look at these patterns in ourselves and to see, I can see myself go on both ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. food wise. Mm -hmm. Um, and money, not as much, uh, but, Anything I want to I want to ask you where how do we know when we've crossed the line from healthy consciousness and awareness to control and disordered behavior? What are the signs? That's such a good question, Kate. I think it's subtle at first. You know, like if we think of it as a spectrum, and we kind of want to be somewhere in the middle range of the spectrum to feel, you know, like we're we have certainty, but we're not gripping too tight in all of that sort of experience, I think it's going to actually be sensation. Mm. I think as we move to one end of the spectrum or the other, we're going to experience something. Now, what that is for each person is going to be very different. Like what I experience when I go into kind of like a constricted state, for me, it's sort of like mostly in my chest and mostly in my throat. And I can notice my heart rate pick up or I can notice like just a tightening where somebody else might have like major digestive distress or someone else might get a migraine. Right. Like you said before, we're all going to have a different body system that's going to be our barometer for when something's mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Tracking into the physical sensations is profound work. And it does take presence and some of them are more subtle. So there's like, you know, there's the more subtle sensations that are easily missed when we're really busy, mm -hmm. when we're rushing, when we're driving really fast through traffic, when we're chaotically trying to get through our to-do list. Like, yeah, maybe we're not noticing subtle sensations because we're distracted and stressed and rushed. It's hard to be present. Yeah, which, which so, is why we do it. Right. But, but, but then it gets so loud. When it gets so yeah. loud, we're like, oh my gosh, where, how did I miss this? Life. It takes over our yeah. lives. So, you know, the, the, the recommendation, of course, is to slow it down, to bring more presence to whatever it is we're doing. And of course, you know, that's also a practice. And then we can start to cue into the subtle sensations before they get so loud. Mm -hmm. And that could be with money, that could be with food, that could be with decisions, that could be with just listening to our intuition. Um, you know, I overrode my intuition for at least the first 20, 30 years of my life before I even knew I could start listening. Yeah. I didn't even know it was possible. You know, it wasn't even, it wasn't even in my MO. Yeah. But now, 
once I made an agreement with myself to listen to my intuition and wisdom through sensation most of the time, sometimes like, you know, a knowing, but often in the body, it's a complete game changer. How does your intuition show up for you physically? It, I think there's a couple different ways depending on like what the intuition's about. Um, definitely when it's danger or something that might feel unsafe, I notice my heart rate start to go up. I notice my stomach tighten. I notice my throat tighten. Um, and when it's more of like a positive thing, like um, something good is coming and I'm like, ooh, that feels good. I, I tend to get like the full body tingles. Mm. And, you know, I, I've looked at them a lot and been like, hmm, I have the full body tingles. Is that good? Is that bad? What is that? And the thing is with that sensation for me is it's neither really pleasant nor unpleasant. It's just a sensation. Interesting. It's, you know, it's just kind of there. It's just a sensation. But some of the ones where it's like danger or something isn't right or someone doesn't feel safe or that can be a little more like unpleasant. Okay. A little more like... It's, but I have a question then, you know, here you are on this book tour, you're on the precipice of, you know, of launching your first book, which is so exciting. And I know you've, you know, you've had a private practice in Boulder. You've been doing this work for so long, but this is definitely taking your visibility to the next level. So what are the sensations that you're experiencing around being at a growth edge mm -hmm. with your career? Because sometimes I think that we can mistake those same sensations for this is a bad idea because what you and I both know about the nervous system is anything that's unfamiliar, it will register as unsafe at mm. first. Yeah. It's, it's a very multi-layered question and I love it because it will help me as well as I like name it going forward <laughs> into this new phase. Um, so <clears throat> what I've noticed happening with the growth edge is yeah, tingling sometimes. A little anxiety, but mm. the kind, actually I read a book this, this year called Good Anxiety, mm. Wendy Suzuki, I think, okay. Dr. Wendy Suzuki. Um, anyways, I've been really just also telling myself like, okay, a little anxiety, that's good. Like it actually puts us into a state of a little heightened awareness and kind of keeps us on our toes and that's helpful. But what's also been really helpful for me when I start to notice a little dysregulation within my system around growth and expansion is actually like talking to the different parts of my system. And, you know, I have imagined this many times with different iterations of the round table inside of my psyche. Um, at times I've had, you know, different archetypal goddesses sitting around the table being like, okay, yeah, you might feel a little bit like this one right now, or this one has something to say. Sometimes it's just like different parts of the mind, you know, like, yeah, there's a part that would rather stay comfortable. There's a part that is like, bring it. Mm -hmm. There's a part that would like to, um, you know, hide and, you know, it just goes on and yeah. on. And, um, really being honest with myself about sort of what that looks like at any given experience, any given morning, you know, to sort of check in with, and then remembering that there's this kind of higher part as well. And that higher part, the true self, you know, there's so many ways to describe the true self. Um, when I can anchor in there and be like, okay, I see you anxiety. I see you, the one who wishes you were at home, like cuddling your dog. Mm -hmm. I see the one who's like wants to hide. It's, I can have more self-compassion that way from kind of my true self. And that has really helped me to like reconcile with mm -hmm. some of those parts and to feel a little bit more grounded. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, it's, it's a process. <laughs> it is a process. In your experience, uh, being with those different parts, um, how, how does that impact your nervous system? Well, when I can take the role of the true self mm -hmm. and trust the process and comfort those parts, whatever they're doing, some of them are definitely like fight or flight. They're like, get me out of here. Mm -hmm. Others are just like frozen in fear. You know, when I can take that seat of kind of taking care and compassionately governing those parts, um, 
it down regulates, you know, I get back into parasympathetic, I can slow my breathing, mm-hmm. I can use visualizations, I can use affirmations, I can just anchor in, in a way that is way more regulating. Whereas if I didn't have that in my psychology and like that understanding, I feel like one of those could take over at any moment. Yeah. And then it's, you know, then it's like, whoa, like, and the other thing that's really helpful, Kate, and I'm sure you've thought this through in your own expansion and your own, you know, kind of visibility in your work. When I get stuck in this is about me, it really makes it worse. It and, really does. And the truth for me, and I know like you well enough to know this for you too, like this is not about me. This book is not about me. My work is not about me. I really feel like, well, first of all, the book just came through very, very um, quickly and sort of like, you know, just kind of like appeared. Not the book proposal, not the, you know, not that part, but like the writing of the book, you know, it just kind of like channels through through. for the most part. It was tiring. Parts of it were tiring, but there felt like a really important mission here. And that is that we don't have time to miss our lives because we're worried about how we look in the mirror or what, how many calories are in our salmon or, you know, what have you. Like that makes me sad. Yeah. That we spend, women, I mean, spend so much time worrying about these things and obsessing about these things that like the most magical sunset could happen right before our eyes and we don't see it. Or we can't experience the joy of sitting around a table with friends and family celebrating or enjoying a meal because we're so stuck in the experience of the story. And when I hear how many iterations of that have occurred through my clients and how their experience is so tainted so often by food. And I know by money, this can happen so easily as well. It just, it's like, it just takes us out of the experience of the beauty of life. And that is sad. And so when I can come from that place in my work and be like, this is a mission that I have for us all to be well-nourished with love and to be attending to ourselves with love rather than through punishment, self-hatred, self-loathing, trying to look a certain way, trying to like eat a certain way so that we're accepted by our friends or whatever we have going on. Um, it, it just breaks my heart. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I do what I do. That helps me to grow. Mm. Cause then I don't get stuck in my own little small mind about like what people think about, you know, how I look on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think that was the perfect place to end. Like that was so <laughs> good. I just, I want to, I want to just like, let it be a mic drop. So Thank Sue, you. Oh, so good. And I think we can all apply that to our own lives, to our own work. If people want to connect with you, if they want to get the book, where should they go? Where should they connect? Hmm. So boldernutrition.com, pretty simple to remember is my website. Everything is there. Instagram is just at Boulder Nutrition. Um, I have lots of free things on my website for people to experience my work. I have, you know, lots of offerings for people to see. Like what's, what? What's one free thing that's on your website that people might want? I have I have a really great free download that's called um, Make Peace with Your Plate, hmm. Cultivating Daily Practice for Food and Freedom. Um, and it has some really fun recipes as well. Great. It's right under the free section. It's right on the homepage when you, you know, put your email in and et cetera. So that's one really fun little offering. It's like a microcosm of the book, I guess you Mm -hmm. could say. Um, And I have a podcast called Satiate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's um, a little bootstrapped podcast that I've been doing for fun for the last few years and just interviewing really interesting people and having fun with that. Um, I lead lots of women's retreats and I have my private practice, some online courses. So beautiful, lots of different things. And the book is available wherever books are sold. The book is available wherever books are sold. Yeah. April 9th pub date. Amazing. Well, congratulations on Thank launching you. this beautiful book, all of your incredible work. Thank you for being here to have this conversation okay. with me. Thank you so much for inviting me and just for being a part of this journey. And really your work has influenced me for so long. 
And I really appreciate just getting to spend time with you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much for tuning in for this incredible episode of Plenty. We really got to unpack some things around food and the nervous system and our control behavior and our unconscious and money and nutrition and just the way we eat and how we move through the world and stress. I'm just, I'm thinking about a lot of things. I hope you are too. If you liked this episode, text the link to a friend. Share it on your social. If you're enjoying Plenty, please subscribe, leave us a review, leave us a rating. And of course, I cannot wait to see you for our next episode. Until then. Woohoo! You made it to the end of an episode of Plenty. Don't you feel expanded already? So if you liked this episode, go ahead and leave us a review, subscribe to the podcast, text a friend and let them know they need to listen in. That helps us spread the word so more people can experience plenty together. And if you want to ease your path to creating wealth, I created a money breakthrough guide for you where I interviewed over 20 of my high earning women friends and I asked them what their biggest money breakthrough guide was and the responses were so mind blowing and helpful, I knew I needed to pass them along to you. This is the kind of thing that is often only shared behind closed doors, but now you can access it totally for free. So head over to katenorthrup.com forward slash breakthroughs and get the guide. Again, that's katenorthrop.com forward slash breakthroughs. And I'll see you next time for plenty.